Welcome into Fatty's Feast, everyone, where we make the best food you'll ever eat without leaving your backyard. My name is Josh. Today we are talking about what I consider the most important thing in barbecue, and that is building and maintaining a clean fire in your offset smoker. Let's get started. Now, if you're just getting started in backyard barbecue, which I hope most of you watching are, your main concern is probably what type of wood should I use in my smoker? And that's all fine and dandy. That's an important aspect of barbecue. I actually just made a video about that a few weeks ago. I'll put the link right here somewhere. But the more important thing is being able to maintain a clean fire and even temperatures across your smoking chamber. I said this before in many videos and I'll say it again. If you can't maintain a clean fire, you can have the best wood in the world. It's not gonna matter. Your barbecue is gonna taste like shit. So this video is going to be a little bit longer because I'm very passionate about this. And I struggled with this when I first started. I watched many, many videos on YouTube. I screwed up a bunch of things. And I'm gonna share with you what I've learned over the years of doing this and how I maintain clean fires in my smoker. And like I said, this video is mainly for beginners. But if you've been doing this for any amount of time and you have tips or suggestions for people, leave them in the comments. I'd love to hear yours. And maybe you can take something from my video that you can use in your cooking experience. All right, wow, that was graceful. So the first thing we need to create a fire or to make barbecue is wood, right? I'm not gonna talk about that too much today because like I said, I covered that in the last video, but a very important thing is your wood storage. So this is my main wood storage area. As you can see, I have a tarp over this. I have a pallet and a metal thing holding this down so it doesn't blow off. And this pile used to cover the pallets down there. So it was from end to end where these trees are. Notice that this tarp isn't covering the wood completely. It still has room to breathe. And we want that because otherwise our wood's gonna get moldy and it's not gonna dry out as well. So if I lift this up, we can see we got some really well seasoned wood here. It's nice and dry. I have my wood sorted out by its type. So right over here, I got some maple and hickories in the middle. And then over here I have oak, which I mentioned in the last video, that's what I primarily use for smoking. Now this particular wood I got from a local tree service. It was already pre-seasoned, so I could just bring it here and throw it on the smoker, no problem. But right in here, which is in my garage, I'm sorry about the lighting, it's terrible. I'm gonna take my sunglasses off. I have a bunch of hickory wood, and I got this wood from a friend. He has great wood. John, if you're watching this, I love your wood. Yeah. Anyway, this stuff is almost to the point where I'd use it in the smoker. It's, it's dried out enough, but this was sitting in his yard all winter when he was clearing a lot. So I've just kept this stuff here where it's dry just to air out, and I will be using it on my smoker very shortly. So the first thing in building and maintaining a clean fire is getting dry wood. If you come across a bunch of wood on the side of the road that's just been sitting there and you don't know how long it's been there, you're gonna probably have to season it. You can't just take wood, split it, and then throw it on the smoker. Now you also don't want wood that's like extremely dry, extremely rotted, or waterlogged. Now if you don't know how dry your wood is, you could purchase a moisture meter. I'll find a link to one of those and I'll put it down in the description. But moisture meters are a great tool to help see if your wood is in that perfect range and I can't remember the numbers I think it's 10 to 12 percent but you can use that to see okay can I burn this wood or is it going to be a pain in the ass I don't personally use one I know how dry the wood is that I use the pile that I have in my backyard that's two years old now and like I said that was already pre-seasoned this stuff is almost to a year it's about 10 months so it'll be ready soon if not ready now so the next thing we need to talk about is the size of your wood. People, size matters. It doesn't matter what they say. So the size of the wood you're gonna use is gonna depend on what type of smoker you have. In your backyard smokers, you're not gonna use a piece of wood that's this size. However, in your 500 gallon pits, your 1,000 gallon pits, yeah, this is, this is what you're using. So first we gotta talk about length. And the easiest way to determine the length of your wood is by looking at the firebox. Now, not every smoker is going to have this handy dandy doorway, but mine does. And if I can't fit in here like this, I'm not using this length wood, I have to cut it down. And personally, I'm not gonna use anything that's more than two inches on either side of this doorway. I, I don't wanna even struggle with it. Now, the next thing we have to talk about is the girth of your wood. That's also very important, sometimes overlooked. So this, even when I cut it in half, it's, it's too girthy, it's too thick. And the reason I know that is because of trial and error. I've come out here and burned many fires in here trying to figure out the size of wood I wanna use. So your smoker might be different than mine. You gotta just test it out and play with it and see what happens. What I've come to settle on is something like this. Now this is a piece that's been cut in half and that's about the thickness I'm gonna use. Let me give you a close up of my, my mini wood. Isn't that cute? And when I get down here and start pulling things out, I have many different wood thicknesses. Uh, this one's about half the thickness of this one. And I have wood that's just not as good looking. So I'll use those for different 
situations that we'll talk about later on. But let's talk about how to get your wood to this thickness and this length. And I promise I'm not selling you any magical formulas for this. This is what I do. Come with me. Okay, so in here is my wood processing plant. Yeah, it's pretty uh, dinky. But right here I have my electric six ton splitter. And then over here I have my handy dandy saw. Now in my first brisket video, I didn't have either of these. I did all the splitting by hand and sawing it by hand, which was a pain in the ass. So if you're like me and cheap, you're probably not gonna wanna go out and spend a bunch of money on stuff to process wood. You can do it by hand, but for me, I like just the ease of not worrying about it. So a few hundred bucks and some convenience can save you a lot of time. I'll put a link once again for both of these products in the description. So let's get this bad boy split and cut to the length I would use in my smoker. So looking at this, I think I can get four splits out of this. And once again, you can buy a gas splitter. I just like the electric, it's convenient, and gas prices suck right now. And for me, it, it works because my wood's already split to a reasonable level. So with this, just hold it like that. And we got two splits. So I'm gonna take this and split it down one more time. And this is a piece of maple, so it's splitting very easily, but that's the thickness I want. Now, if you're using oak and hickory and splitting those, especially with a splitter like this that's not as strong, you're gonna get those situations where it doesn't split evenly or it just it cracks or whatever. Like I said, you can use that specific wood for different circumstances, but if it's a really nasty piece of wood, just throw it in your fire pit or something. And then over here, I take it to my saw and I hate using saws, they freak me out, they always have. But for this particular piece, I'm just gonna cut it in half. This is about as good as it gets, people. Once again, your lengths may vary. It depends on how your wood splitting goes and how big the pieces are. Some of the pieces of hickory I have are smaller, so it is what it is. But I would personally much rather have smaller pieces than larger pieces. I feel like you can work with smaller wood a little easier. And once you throw a big piece of wood on and your temperature spike, you, you can't really take that back. Plus, I feel the smaller they are, the cleaner of a fire they burn. Okay, so we got our wood. Before we make a fire in the smoker, I wanna talk about modifications. Once again, I've made videos on the modifications this smoker had and the things I've done to it in the past, so you can check those out. But a lot of times, certain modifications don't necessarily enable you to burn a better fire. For example, the ashtray. Now this sits directly in the firebox and it's where you put your fire. And the purpose of it is allowing ash to fall through. What I found were a lot of my coals were falling through this. I mean, these are pretty big openings. So that doesn't necessarily allow me to maintain heat and maintain that good coal bed I want. So I took it out. Another little doohickey I made up here from expanded metal was just this V thing. And that fit straight on the ashtray allowing for the coal bed to be more condensed in the middle. And you can get better airflow under the coal bed on the sides of this. But what I found is it works, but once you take the ashtray out, you really don't need it. So yeah. I also got a ton of comments from people in previous videos talking about uh, charcoal boxes. I was gonna purchase one, but I've just found over time that not having anything in the firebox works the best for me. I have nothing against them. I have nothing against any of these modifications. I just don't use them. And last but not least, the baffle plate. I hate this thing. I've talked about it so many times, but this thing came with the smoker. It was welded in and this sat right in the smoking chamber, right next to the firebox. It was actually on an angle. So it would push the heat down as it came in through. And the reason for that is they wanted to have better heating throughout the cooking chamber. Because obviously the closer you get to the firebox, the hotter it's going to be. But what this does is it makes the hot spot of the smoker smack dab in the middle. I could have same temps on each side here, but right here would always be 100 or even 150 degrees warmer. So when you're cooking a brisket, you're gonna burn the shit out of the bottom of it. And I've done that so many times. I eventually had enough, took it out. I don't know why they have this stupid thing. I think it is the most pointless thing they could put in the smoker. So yeah, don't use that either. But enough negativity. What about the modifications I do use? The first obvious one, the stack extension. Made a video on this, I'll put it here. You can check it out if you wanna do the same thing to your smoker. This is a cheap and easy way to get more draw through your smoker, extending the stack, and I think it works absolutely fantastic. The drawback, I can't use this thing. Don't care, I never use it anyway. And we'll talk about using dampers later on in the video. I also have my fire brick in my smoking chamber. Somebody just asked me about that the other day and whether they think it's worth it. Have I noticed a huge difference 
Not really. But I keep it in there because if the fire goes out because I fell asleep, or it's winter time and the temperatures are frigid, I still have that brick that absorbs the heat. And that will allow a small window where I can maintain temp still. So then I don't freak out when my fire does go out. And lastly, grill gasket. That looks absolutely terrible. I put this on my smoker before I knew what I was doing because other people had done it and said I needed it. But as I've come to find out, until you do a test burn in your smoker and season it and see what happens, don't make any modifications. There was a little bit of gap in between the lid and the door, especially on the firebox. But honestly, I don't feel like I lose that much heat, so it's probably not really worth it. I probably could have gotten away with not doing it, but it's on here, so I kept it on. Now you might be saying, well, Josh, do I need these modifications just because you did it, or what's the deal? I don't know. You gotta do some practice burns. That's exactly what I'm doing today. I'm just coming out here and doing a practice burn for you guys so I can show you what I do. Until you do a practice burn, do not assume you need anything and do not take anything out. Do not make any changes. Just do a practice burn, figure it out. It's the only way you're gonna know. But enough yapping, let's get to building a fire. Okay, we got the tools we need. Yes, paper, if you can believe that. So there's a few things you can use to build your fire. Newspaper works just fine. That's what I always use. If you got any of this paper mache formed crap, whatever that is, you can use that too. This burns a little longer than paper, so you get a little better flame. If I'm using my charcoal chimney, I usually put this in the bottom. And last but not least, this is soaked butcher paper from something. I, I used it for something, I don't remember. Butcher paper is probably the best thing you can use. It's gonna be a little harder to light. But once it gets lit, all that grease on there is just gonna do a great job of building a good fire. Plus it's gonna add a little bit more flavor to the wood. So there you go, win-win. Now, you can use a charcoal chimney. These things are great. If you're using charcoal, you're gonna want to use this. And basically, all you're gonna do is crinkle your paper up, throw it down, and there you go. Easy as that. You put your charcoal in the top and you light it at the bottom and you let it burn. Now make sure you don't do that on your deck or something. Make sure you're on something hard, some stone, or just, if you could, put it right in your firebox. I don't like to do that because it might tip over, even though it has like a thing here. And when I'm using charcoal, I just use Kingsford original charcoal, whatever I can get my hands on. Now I don't always use this. I'm actually not gonna use this today. The only time I use charcoal is if I'm trying to get a really, really good coal bed going for a long cook. If I'm gonna be out here for a few hours making chicken or something, I'm not really that worried. But if I'm making a brisket, yeah, bet your ass I'm gonna be using some charcoal. It's gonna give a great coal bed with minimal effort. Now I usually just fill this thing right to the top and then light it and once all the charcoal is glowing and on fire and ignited, I dump it into the firebox. I also have seen people do that and then dump another chimney of non-lit charcoal into the firebox just to add to their amazing coal bed. So that's an option too. I haven't done that, but I might do it once in a while if I notice my coal bed's really suffering. But if you don't wanna go out and buy a charcoal chimney or buy charcoal, there's another option. Kindling. Yes, this is wood that I have taken from my splits and I just throw it in here and I use this to start my fires I don't care about. There's also some junk wood in here too that I didn't like. But all this stuff is just bark and just small dried out stuff that will work fine for igniting a fire. Might be a little dirty, you know, but it is what it is. You don't want to waste anything. So let's build this bad boy up. Just going to take some crumpled up newspaper, throw it right in the bottom. And I'm going to be generous here, so we want to uh, make sure the fire gets lit. I'll just dig through put some small pieces of wood right on top. Like I said, this stuff is very dry. And yeah, it's gonna be smoky. I'm not doing this in any kind of particular method yet, but this should be the dirtiest part of your fire right when you start it. And once I got some good pieces in there, I'm just gonna light it. And you can light it in multiple spots, you can light it in one, it doesn't matter, however you wanna do it. Now this is gonna get going, and like I said, it's going to be dirty. Your neighbors are gonna hate you for a few minutes. I always recommend using a long lighter. Don't just use a regular lighter, especially if you're using a charcoal chimney because you wanna get under there and light the underside. A regular lighter doesn't always do the trick. And notice here, my entire smoker, wide open. I have no closures, nothing at all, because I don't want that disgusting shit getting into my cooking chamber for later. Now this kindling and stuff isn't gonna be our coal bed necessarily. We're gonna build that up. Whereas charcoal, if you use that, that can be your coal bed. So some people might argue this is a little bit more time consuming. I found it's really not because it takes about a half an hour to get your charcoal chimney fully lit. And this process takes about a half an hour as well. So it, it's not really a big deal in my opinion. I'm just keeping an eye, making sure it's not gonna fall out or anything like that. You don't want that to happen. So once this kindling is fully ignited, we'll come back and build our coal bed. And 
And after about 10 minutes, this is what we have. Just burning down this kindling. I'm just gonna use my poker tool here to move it out a little bit. So now I'm gonna get under my pit here and I'm gonna look for pieces of wood that are maybe thicker, like this one, this one right here. Let's do this one and let's do this one. Now I'm just gonna take my tongs and I'm gonna lay these out right on top of these coals. I'm just going back and forth. We're building a log cabin sort of thing and we'll do one more. Once again, you're gonna get dirty smoke, that's okay. So Fire Science 101, fire likes to rise. That's why we're building a log cabin because we want the fire to come up and this is going to be our coal bed. These are gonna burn down before we put another piece on and then we'll put our food on. So this is why the process is a little bit time consuming to start a fire, especially if you want it to be a really good, clean, working fire. And the process that I just did is exactly the same if you're using charcoal. I do that with charcoal as well. It works great because then we get that wood flavor incorporated into our coals and we'll be good to go. I'm going to keep this open for the time being, but in about five or so minutes, I'll shut it because the fire should be pretty clean burning by that point. And then we can allow our smoker to come up to temperature. Two things as far as tools I want to mention that have been a huge help to me. First of all, the poker tool. This is great for not only moving the fire around, but cleaning and moving wood backwards and whatnot. And I use this for a long time solely, but what I also have are some really cheap tongs. You saw me just building this with the tongs. It's still hot. Yeah, I should probably be wearing my gloves, but you know what? I'm a man, hashtag be a man. You can't really do that with this. You, you need to be wearing gloves. Whereas this, if I have a piece of wood that falls or something just isn't right, I just need to adjust something real quick. I can just grab hold of it and do whatever I need to do. So go out and spend like $3 on a set of these, maybe even $2, I don't even know what they cost. Another thing to keep in mind, if you're using charcoal specifically, you want to have this fire door closed before you dump any charcoal into there because there's a good chance it might come out this side and you don't want that landing on your foot or lighting something on fire, or whatever it does. So just make sure this door is closed, dampers are closed, and then as soon as it's in there, you can open everything back up. So we're at a point now where I think I'm gonna start shutting everything down. We'll shut this down as well, and once again, we wait. You got a little bit of dirty smoke coming out of the chimney. That's okay. That'll go away shortly. And we can see our temperature gauge is slowly climbing. It's going to get to probably about 400. Uh, that's the max I can get it to when I'm starting fires. And our little log cabin continues to burn brightly. Just like that, clean burning smoke. That's what we want to see throughout the majority of this cook. We don't want billowing white disgusting smoke. And our cook chamber is up to about 400 now. So that's where it's going to hover until we're ready to put food on. So this has taken me in total about 20 minutes and now we just wait. But be sure to take this time into consideration when you are about to smoke something. I like to start my fires first before I prep anything. That way I can get all the dirtiness out of the way and then I can build my log cabin, let the temps come up to 400 or whatever they get to and then drop back down. And by the time that happens, which is usually about a half an hour to 20 minutes extra, so 45 minutes total, I can put my food on and we're good to go. So let's sit here and wait for this to come back down to about 250 before we do anything else. Okay, it's been about 15 minutes. We're still hovering around the 400 mark, but I wanted to take this time to talk to you a little bit about dampers. Now, most smokers have two dampers. I got one on the stack, which I obviously can't use because the stack extensions in the way. And then there's one at the firebox door. Now, not every smoker has the exact same ones and some have none at all. Uh, there are some smokers like the fat stack smokers. The backyard ones have dampers that actually run along the side of the firebox because air comes through and you can adjust how much air you want that way. Pretty neat, I've always wanted to own one of those. So fat stacks, if you're listening and you wanna gift me a smoker, that'd be awesome, please. Love you. Anyway, my personal opinion on dampers is I don't use them really at all. The reason for that is when you start cutting off airflow to a fire, you're gonna start burning a dirtier fire most of the time. Just like if your house is on fire. If you leave everything open, guess what? The fire is gonna spread throughout the house much quicker. If you close everything down, then the fire is gonna get deprived of oxygen and maybe even go out on its own. Granted, it's not blowing through your roof. So I personally, like I said, I don't screw with dampers. I keep the firebox door closed most of the time unless the fire is having a real problem getting air. But the one time I do use dampers is for temperature swings. Because like I said, the wider open you are, the more air is gonna come through the smoker and the more heat you're gonna get traveling through. So let me bring you in close. Where are we at now? Four, oh yeah, just under 400, 375. And right here I have my Thermoworks Smoke 4. So let me open this up for you. I'm gonna take my probes and put them where I normally put them. So I made a ham yesterday, that's why they are located where they are. I always have one probe at the stack and I have one probe right where the meat rests. So if I'm doing a brisket, it's usually about right here. 
And then if I close this down, we can see what happens. I know I keep saying it, but going back to doing practice burns, this is how I know my smoker. I know that the probe here is obviously gonna be hotter, it's closer to the firebox. This one's gonna be off by probably about 25 to 30 degrees. And then the one up top, because heat goes up, it's probably gonna be about 50 degrees to 30 degrees different than the middle one. Found that out doing test burns and taking the baffle plate off and all that good stuff. So after a while, you should be able to know what your smoker is gonna do when you put a piece of wood on. But let's say in this situation, I put a piece of wood on, I have a temperature spike and I need to back that down. So we can see there pretty good difference in temps, just 283, 273. But if I back this down, we're gonna see the temperatures drop. I don't wanna back it down all the way, just to about right there. And now we can see slowly but surely, the temperatures are keeping steady, but they're gonna start dropping a little bit. I'm not gonna sit here all day with you guys doing this, but as you can see, a little bit less of a difference in temps. So that's really the only time I recommend screwing with any of the dampers, but you need to keep an eye on it just in case the fire gets smothered or something goes wrong. So we're about at the point where I think I would add wood. Now I always add wood before I put something on at the beginning of the cook because we're gonna burn a dirtier fire for a few minutes. I don't want that getting on my food right away. And we're also gonna have the cover open to put the food on, so we're gonna lose substantial temperature. So once we close it, we should be at a good spot where we're not gonna have a huge temperature spike. So the first thing I'm gonna do, open this up. As you can see, our wood's burned through very nicely. I'm just gonna turn this to coals. You wanna do this every time. I'm gonna open my damper back up. I'm gonna take two pieces of wood throw them on evenly spaced out just like so. Plenty of space for air to get through. We're gonna burn a dirty fire for a second and then they should ignite right up. And I'm keeping the firebox door open until these catch. Going nicely now, we can shut this down. And then what I'm gonna do in the meantime, I'm gonna find my next pieces of wood. So I'm just gonna bend down, get one of these, throw it right on the firebox. And you can put as many of these on there as you want. The more the better. And what that's gonna do is raise the temperature of that wood. So when we throw it on the fire, it's not gonna smolder for five minutes as we lose temperatures smoking our food. Now let's say you have a really stubborn piece of wood. It's just not igniting or it keeps going out. How do you handle that? Well, if you've tried adding some airflow, tried opening the firebox and trying to get some more air in that way, and it's still not working, the best thing I can recommend is take it off. Just use your tongs, take it out, throw it in something that's fireproof, like a metal container. If it's not gonna burn, it's not gonna burn. Some wood is like that. Sometimes it gets wet or something, it's just not working. So there's no shame in just taking it out and throwing it off to the side safely and letting it sit there and smoke. I'm literally one degree difference right now, that's, that's good. Now the same thing can be done if you have huge temperature spikes, whatever. You, you put a piece of wood on it, raise the temp too much, and you're like, I need to back this down. Instead of screwing with the dampers and all that, just take it off, it'll be fine. And that's why I said I like having that fire brick in there because that actually allows me to keep some heat in the chamber if I have a situation go wrong. So we're looking at our smoke that's a little bit dirty, but it's not dirty enough to affect the flavor. The cleaner we get it, the better, but for right now, it's looking pretty good. Another thing I always recommend, water pan. I'm not putting it in right now because I'm not cooking anything, but I always put it right here, right next to the firebox. This allows you to maintain temps better throughout the smoke chamber, and it also adds a little bit of moisture so nothing will dry out as much as if you didn't have it in there. Now obviously putting a water pan in is not gonna make your brisket more juicy because the juiciness in meat is typically rendered fat, but it just controls the temps a little better, stuff won't dry out as easily, and you have a less chance of burning something. Now one of the things that used to freak me out so much, especially the first time I cooked a brisket, was having a dirty fire. I had a dirty fire more than I'd like to admit. There was one point where I was having a complete mental breakdown and wanted to return the smoker because it was a waste of my money. I couldn't get a clean fire. I couldn't get temps to be maintained. It was just a mess. So if you wanna see me do that, go check out my first brisket cook. But once again, I didn't know what I knew now. My first problem was my wood sizes weren't correct. I was putting wood that was way too big inside. And if you use wood that's too big, you're not gonna be able to maintain a coal bed right in the middle. It's gonna be very spread out. So the smaller the wood, the better. Once again, I love small wood. But I've also learned over time that a dirty fire is not a huge deal if it's temporary. If you put a piece of wood on your fire, it's gonna smoke, it's gonna be a little bit dirty. We prevent the dirty smoke from coming into the smoke chamber by opening that firebox door as much as possible. But not every smoker has the luxury of having a door you can open to vent all that dirty smoke out. So at the end of the day, if you put a piece of wood on and you get some dirty smoke, it is what it is. Five minutes here or there isn't gonna ruin your barbecue. Having 20 minutes of it and then having a clean fire for five, that might do something. But don't freak out if you burn a dirty fire for a few minutes here or there, it's not a big deal. Like I said, that brisket, I burned a dirty fire for more than I'd like to admit. 
but it came out tasting fine. So right away, my stress level just sort of went down when it comes to burning a dirty fire. Don't want billowing white crap coming out, but once in a while, it's fine. Now also keep in mind, and this is just a fact that sucks, but your backyard smokers like this one are just a little more difficult to use than a larger smoker. You can maintain temps very easily in a 500 gallon pit. But with this, you put a piece of wood on and you don't know what's gonna happen sometimes. And the unfortunate thing is, the hotter of a fire you're burning, the cleaner it's going to be. So when you're dealing with temps at like 225, 250, you have a better chance of having a dirtier fire and a more difficult time maintaining temps. So once again, that's why it's very important to know your smoker. Know when you need to put a new piece of wood on to avoid a temperature spike and also maintain your temps. So for this particular smoker, when I add wood, I always do a minimum of two pieces and I try to have them similar size. I don't like to put a big piece next to a little piece. If I put a big piece on, I'll try to get some kindling or something just to allow the process to be a little smoother. And then what I'll do is I'll put two on just like I did before. And then once my temperatures drop and these have burned through a good amount, I add wood the opposite way. Once again, two. So I'm just constantly going back and forth, building that continuous log cabin, if you will. So the next thing we need to talk about is when do you add wood? In a smoker like this, you're just not going to have consistent 250 degrees 100% of the time. You're going to have spikes, you're going to have dips, and that's just the reality of it. Once again, as long as you're not going to 350, then to 120, and then 285 to 90, you're not gonna ruin your food. 50 degree differences, even 75 degrees in my experience, don't do shit. So let's say I'm cooking something at around 250. And I say around, because once again, it's not exact. So 250 is my goal. I'm looking for this probe to be somewhere probably around 275, and this one's gonna be about 225. So right smack dab in the middle of what I'm cooking will be hopefully 250. When I see this probe, the one that's always hotter, drop, to about the 250 mark, I know it's time to add more wood. So what does that entail? What we just saw, opening the firebox door, you're gonna lose some heat. But once that's all said and done, this temperature probe is gonna be around 225-ish. And then we add that wood and it's gonna jump back up to probably about 280 and then come back down to 275. But you definitely don't wanna wait for it to be below the 250 mark because then you're gonna have the major differences in temperature. I also know from experience that as soon as I put wood on the smoker, I can walk away for a good 30 minutes without having really any issues. And not a sponsor, but what I love about the Thermoworks X4 is I have this handy dandy remote and I can go inside if it's cold out or whatever, if I'm doing something else, I can just watch my temperatures right on here and not worry about a thing. So this was definitely one of my best barbecue purchases, having two temperature probes at great level, I always say do that. And then one up top, especially if you're cooking something on the top rack. Now that being said, your smoker may be different. Maybe you have to add wood a little sooner. It's all about how it operates and you gotta learn it. I also thought you had to allow the wood to burn completely down to coals before you added wood. That's not the case. If you do that, you're gonna have drops in temperature. Some smokers, they function that way and okay, cool. But for my particular smoker, no. I always add wood before the wood has burned through. And yeah, it's burned. Like it's not fresh wood that I just put on there. It's gonna be burned, but it's not gonna be down to coals. But just going back to the Thermoworks, I think this is the best purchase of my barbecue life. I didn't buy it, so whatever but it's a few hundred bucks and you get a really good idea of where your temperatures are, which is very important in small smokers like this. Don't drive yourself crazy because it's very accurate and it'll do little dips in here and there. And you'll, if you worry about that, you're gonna lose your mind. But if you just use it as a good guide, the three thermometers are a great tool. And since I put wood on, we've been at 300, literally at 300 this whole time we've been talking. If I look up, very clean smoke, it's working great. Let's take a look at our fire, still burning very clean. And in about five minutes is when I would add more wood. Once again, vents open all the way. The last thing I wanna mention that I forgot about, that firebox door. If you have that open all the way, you're gonna lose so much heat from that firebox. So when I'm burning a dirty fire, I always open it because I really don't care. I wanna get that smoke out and I wanna increase airflow. But if you sit there with that door open the whole time you're cooking, you're just gonna burn through wood like crazy. If you don't care, or maybe you're trying to stay warm like I do in the winter time, sure, whatever. But just keep in mind that's a thing and you don't necessarily want it open 100%. I, if, if I didn't have vents, I would just crack it. So here I am adding more wood. And you can see I had to adjust this because we were getting a lot of dirty smoke. This back piece was here and wouldn't light. So I just propped it up just like this. You have to be creative sometime. That way the air can get under both of them. And we don't want that to smolder. So it's looking a lot better now. Might just move it a little bit more. Just like that. That looks good. Just screw around with it. You'll get there. So I know this was a very long video of me just blabbing and blabbing and blabbing, but if you're a beginner, I really hope you appreciated it. I hope you gained some knowledge from the things I've screwed up. I hope this will make you a better pit master and don't get frustrated. 
in the beginning. You got to learn, you got to do your test burns, you got to work through all this stuff and learn your smoker. I've been doing this for a few years and I'd say this year has been my best year yet. I finally feel comfortable with everything. I can walk away and not worry about what's going to happen. I can add wood and know what's going to happen. It takes time, but the more you practice, the better you're going to get at it. So if you're also an avid barbecuer like myself and I left anything out of this video, tips or tricks you know, please leave them in the comments. I want to hear from them. If you can make my life easier, great. That's what's great about this barbecue community is we just share knowledge and share what we like, recipes, methods on cooking. And that's why I love barbecue so much personally. And I really hope I shared something with you of value today. If I did, please smash that like button. It means so much to me. It gets my content out to more people. Once again, drop some comments. I'd love to hear from you guys. Over here is going to be another smoking video. It's customized for you. You're going to love it. And right here is the smoker how-to playlist. A bunch of things in there I talk about. Great knowledge. You'll love that too, especially if you're first starting out. And right in the middle, subscribe if you love me so much. Until next time, everyone, stay safe, stay happy, stay healthy, and stay tubby.